moved to Sunnyside and that's when the trauma started for me where I got sexually abused, right? By a neighbor. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity to use our platform as a space for healing, um, conversations that ignite power, conversations that facilitate restoration. Those who are watching, those who are consuming, those who are listening, their lives will be affected and influenced by the story to change their lives in a positive manner, that God, it's not through money, it's not through our own will and our desires, but it's through your work that we are able to reach a full restoration, a full healing, and a full power in our lives. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Thank You've you. never made me do that. You're the first person to make me do that on camera. We do that off camera. Okay. But I'm respecting the spirit because if you said, let's do it, it means the spirit directed you for us to direct this conversation in that manner. Okay. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Um, thank you for coming here. Uh, you're honoring us with a story that is very, what's the word I'm looking for? A story that is very, you're going to be vulnerable with us, a story that is very private that some people wouldn't ordinarily share. Um, some people take their traumas and their mistakes and go through life carrying them without using that as an opportunity to change other people's lives mm -hmm. or for, the, for it to be a testimony. So more than anything, thank you so much for honoring us and our platform um, with your story. Thank you, brother. Thank you. That was well said. Thank you very much. Sure, sure. You are happy, mm. uh, which is a beautiful name because thank you. It, it signifies the healing process that you've gone through and everything that you've been through. Maybe before we, we get too far, do you know who named you Happy? Oh, well, I love that you're asking that. So my name is Happy Happiness. Okay. Morale uh -huh. Patrishko. Mm -hmm. My father named me Happy okay. Okay. because I was born on New Year's Day. Oh, wow. And I take my name very, very seriously. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you know, do you know what an empath is? Yes. Before? Yes. Yes. So I'm a typical definition of an empath, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I hide a lot and I stay in my shell a lot because if I go out on the outside world, I tend to see people before they, people don't understand like how hard it is to be an empath because we're so full of love. Mm -hmm. And when we go out there, and immediately, like, I can tell what a person's thinking, what a person's going through, and that stuff carries on you. Like, for instance, if I go to malls, I'm always wearing sunglasses because I can tell what people are going through. Sure. That's what an empath is. Yeah, so you can yeah. tell if somebody has, like, a bad spirit. You can tell somebody if, if a person has a good heart. And then that stuff immediately, by me just looking, if I do eye contact, I can tell what kind of a character you are. Mm. And then when I get home, I get very, very tired because I can see the pain that oh. the world is going through. Sure, sure, so sure. whether I can take it off me and just like pretend my life is kind of good, but I still see the, the, the struggle of what like the human race goes through. And um, so, you know, when you say your name, you know, me describing my name, naturally I'm a very happy person. Yes, yes. But then I'm also very Empathetic like... Empathetic towards others. Very empathetic. Sure. But because of the streets and how I grew up and how aggressive I grew up, as I'll give you an example. Yesterday, I went to the mall, which I despise. Okay, I had to take care of my kids because they needed stuff to get from the mall. And um, this lady, I looked, I had this eye contact with this lady through my sunglasses, and I just smiled at her because I could see, I could feel that she's going through stuff. It was an older lady, right? And I just smiled at her to say, like, look, I see what you're going through, like that love, you know, like a smile can mean so much to a person that's like going through the most. 
And she looked at me and because of that, she's like, excuse me, excuse me. I'm like, well, there it goes. But because I'm full of this, this so much love for people, uh. but I'm also feel up, filled up with this aggression and this street mentality because love made me tough. So it's like two voices that I have to deal with. Like, what, what is your, what, what are you trying to take advantage of here? And then there's also this voice that's like, you've got to treat them with kindness, treat them with love, you know? So, I, so I said, yeah, what's up? Like, like, what's up? Like, what's your motive here? But then again, I wanted to help. And this older lady was carrying a baby and she said that um, she needs milk. And I had gone to the dentist with my daughter. My daughter, we spent so much money. I knew that I spent thousands and thousands of money. I knew I didn't have money. And she's like, this lady's not asking for milk. She's, as she's not asking for money. She's asking for milk. So I'm like, yeah, the wallet doesn't say much, but happy, just do what she, just do it. So I went to clicks and I was like, kind of like, you know, like, like, I was like a bit edgy as well. And then, but I went to Clicks and she wanted a small bottle and I got her a big bottle and I gave it to her and I asked her what her story was. And this is a granny that's carrying a baby that's not hers. It's her daughter's baby. She's from the township. And, and, and her daughter could be still, again, I thought, you know, she could be on her WhatsApp or on her phone talking to another boy again. She's left her mom missioning, and that's the world we live in. She's mm -hmm. left her mom missioning, looking for, like, ways to take care of this baby. So I bought a big bottle of milk, okay? That's just me coming out into the world sure. and seeing what's going on sure. out there, right? And then there was another, again, uh, this granny here in Bryanston. She's an old lady, and she sells, like, this little things, crochet stuff that she makes. And I had, like, a few, like, I had money with me, right? And then I was about to... Um, Cross the road because I was driving and I said granny would you like some money and she said throw it to me because she was scared to come to the road and I threw it at her but again been an impasse I kept on feeling so bad that has this world come to where we at that this granny is like so desperately asking me to throw their money because with our African culture you know you have to go and give it to granny sure. like politely Correct. and then she's picking up these like coins and I just felt like when I got home I was really tired I mean this is just one day of going out into the world so that's what I'm saying like an empath it's uh, I say this to say this I could easily be in at home and enjoy what God has blessed me with but the reason why I'm here at this platform is because God has, so I'm an introvert. So I can keep all of my thoughts to yourself, to myself. Sure. So the reason why I forced myself, I know it might look so easy and people, this thing is such a delicate thing that yeah. everybody yeah. wants to voice their opinions. But I mean, people can talk so profound and it might sound profound to them and they're like, they can run with that. But people need to be very careful. You can't just come here and speak to the masses because people are so naive and they believe what they want to believe and they run with that. You have to be spiritually alert. So I was like, it was very tough for me to come out here. But the reason why I want to come out here, yes, I want to share my story. Uh, but also, I want to show people that, that, that like, God exists. Yes, restoration is a thing. God exists. And and yeah, so getting back to my name, sorry, brother, getting sure. back to why my name is happy is that you will understand through my story why I had to be the way that I am, as aggressive as I am, but then also why my name means a lot to me. Like you picked up, I'm supposed to be a healer. I'm supposed to be making people happy, you know, but because of life circumstances, we are where we're at now. Hey family, thank you so much for being loyal to Engineering Your Life. I know that if you're watching this, you're probably here for the second time or the third time. And please, if you're here for the second, third time, please may you kindly subscribe. Because if you subscribe, it helps us to get better conversation, get better guests, and get access to creating the best content that we can for you. So please don't forget to subscribe and make sure you continue watching this episode. Life's Circumstances bring you where you are but I want you to take me to the very beginning mm. um take me back 25 years ago 30 years ago when in your formative years when you are finding who you are and just walk me through the journey okay. as best as you can okay so you know when you grow up and you're a little bit older you kind of understand like yo happy you went through a lot sure but as you're growing up you don't and that's the thing with a lot of people 
like only when you're older you're like damn that was a lot that was a lot lot okay so um so papa gemo pedi uh his name is uh gospel maloma but he's from Karas Kukuni so I'm from a royal family sure. so if you follow that Shaka Zulu story yeah yeah that whole story with Shaka my father's story is similar okay you know um so Ketra, my father is from Kukuni Kwara Maloma my great great grandfather is Koshi Maloma and then my grand grandfather is Mpatela Maloma and then Matwana Maloma who then had my father but then my father became an orphan and my on his his grandmother was Melody Morale that's the name that was given to me so he became an orphan and he came to Pretoria and my dad as an orphan achieved a lot he had said i guess having royalty in your blood is very important people don't take it seriously you can be poor but once you still have the royalty in your blood it it, it takes you places okay because even though my dad had nothing he got himself into uh he became a priest uh and then he got himself into politics he was with the ANC and he went to exile for 29 years so i'm an exile baby i was born in zimbabwe but all my siblings were born overseas germany austria all over africa i have a lot of siblings but i'm sort of that the black sheep of the family so all of them are educated but my journey was different so yeah. So then when we came back to uh South Africa in the 80s we stayed in Atridgeville but I had a huge identity crisis mm-hmm. because we spoke English in my household because my mom was from a different country and my father was from a different country and he was in exile overseas for so long our first language was English so after the power that my dad had and he was such an intelligent man of high standards Uh when he came back to exile he lost all of that. And uh I'm what you call a lot lamiki. That's like you know the older if you like way older and then you still have children. So so people used to say your grandfather's here but it was yeah. actually my yeah. dad. Yeah. So with the older siblings they grew up abroad but the little, the young ones my dad was too old and he didn't have the power that he had. So after exile we found ourselves living in a shack in Atridgeville. Mm. for three years from that power the domestic helpers the gardeners the big mansions traveling overseas they had that lifestyle my older siblings but us the younger ones that was that was what we your reality was poverty yes yeah. extreme poverty and back in the day i don't know if you remember they had like in the townships they had those four roomed houses correct our poverty was so bad that we stayed in the shack like way before Shongoville so gets any go cabo in Atridgeville gets an amaga thing and then my dad was like hey the vernac is not vernacking let me try and send you to an indian school okay and i was one of the first black kids in that indian school in lodium in andrew anthony okay so that was still fine until my dad with his power got us into cbd pretoria okay So we grew up in Sunnyside again. We were one of the first black people to grow up in Sunnyside. So when I tell you about the um identity, it's it's common sense. If people like to say, "Oh, when I pull the cool, oh, when I was like like the 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 people love judging people a lot because of like how they carry themselves." So um moved to Sunnyside and that's when the trauma started for me. we uh got sexually abused right by a neighbor his next door neighbor next door neighbor and i was 11 years old do you remember how it started was it recurring or it happened once that's the thing you know people usually talk about sexual abuse like oh i was sexually abused but that's it. your childhood been taken away Imagine living an in innocence of being a child and next thing like some weird stuff is happening to you your childhood is getting taken away from you obviously your mind is going to be completely different to what an innocent child is supposed to be so it is serious 
you pedophiles, you think you can get away with it. They will not get away with it. A lot of people have said to me, happy, why don't you go have that person arrested and stuff like that? There's nothing like God's wrath. So I'm telling you now, I know people casually say this. We were sexually abused or I, I was sexually abused. That's why I became like this. It is hectic when somebody does that to a child. Uh. Because as soon as the child leaves that place, I mean, there's these two white guys that's running around now on TV and they like killed the, their parents because, um, because that happened. When I was older, right, I wanted to go and also like, kill that person that did that to me. But because of Christ, I, I, I forgave that person. Forgiveness is a, is, is a huge thing. So um, how it happened is that they groom you. Okay, so I was roller skating outside our yard and, and then this gentleman came out. He could have been in his 40s. You're he, 11. I'm 11, right? So he came out and he offered me like he had like cake. And I mean, in our house, bro, there is no cake. The, like the fridge is empty. There's just cabbage and there's pop one way, right? This African girl's going to see this, like, there's, there's, it's these greener pastures. I'm going to go. I'm going to accept that cake. It happened. They grew me. It happened like that for a long time. Then the next week, he's inviting me to his crib. And then he's uh, putting cartoons on. So they pretend as though they're your father figure. Huh. I even went home and said, look, this is who I met. There's this uncle there. Nothing was said about it. So I was like, okay, it's all right to do this. And, um, and then... The day that it happened, cartoons is no more cartoons. Now you're showing me pornography, right? And I'm like, oh, okay, interesting. Then he took the, because I was very tiny. Like, I was just, you could see, there was no ways you could take advantage of these 11 year Sometimes I look at 11 year olds and I'm like, happy, maybe you looked like matured and stuff like that. So I would look at like my, my daughter and I'm like, she's so innocent. Uh, like, I teach Fragile. kids ministry. Yes. So fragile, they need protection. I'm like, how? Because I try and think from the uh, pedophiles, pers- like, like how they, how do you do that to try and do that to a kid? I hear you. I hear it's you. It's sick. It is sick. You are sick. You are sick, sick, sick. That's what you are. People need to stop that. Anyway, so then he um, got me on the bed. And that was the first time, like, I didn't even watch, like, stuff like that on TV because my dad was super strict. Like, any kissing, you got to get out the house. Like, my dad was super strict. Got me on the bed, and then he did what he did. And then I had to go to school. Like, how on earth am I going to focus at school? And I was Where's the morning just before school? Yes. No, 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 no. Um, The thing is, like, once that happens to you, I'm sorry to get so graphic, there's like an old person's smile that gets into your body. That's mm. why people need to be very careful with this thing called sex that everyone's just giving it out like that. That stuff is spiritual. Huh. That stuff is spiritual. So when he did that to me, the next day you can just feel, huh. now how on earth are you going to concentrate in school? So I started failing. Did you understand what had happened to you? No. It's like you carry on. You you carry on going to school. You don't understand it at all. Because once it's done, he takes you to the lounge and he puts on the cartoon and he acts like he's a father figure again. Back to the normality. Yes. Yeah, so a lot of people always say, why don't... And people, you need to watch your mouth because you're not that child. Stop saying, why don't you go to a grown-up? Because it's the weirdest thing, especially when you're in a fragile state, especially if you're looking for love, if you don't, like, if people come to you with this, with this, like, I'm here to protect you, and next thing they do that, you think it's part of that, like, huh. safety. This is part of the package of protection. Yes, this is how, like, this is how fathers are supposed to be. It's part of it. You just think it's part of it, you know? Um so that happened, and I just started drop. I started failing. So I went as far as and at six. I'm giving out my age. Um, standard six. What standard six? Grade eight. Grade eight, right? Yes. I went as far as grade eight, and um, I dropped out of school. 
Uh, and I, well, I tried. I went to Lotus Gardens and, um, yeah, school wasn't for me. I was just, I was just mad because the sexual abuse went for long until I turned 13 and I was sexually abused twice. 11 till 13? Yes. It, it, it happened. Mm -hmm. It kept on happening. Mm -hmm. By two different people. How it happened that it was two different people? I told my dad, dad, we got to get out of Sunnyside. I know we can't afford because we're staying in a mental institution called the Salvation Army. And that was like hardcore racists, right? So we're staying in the mental institution. And I said to my dad, we have to move to central Pretoria. There's a cheaper place that we can afford. And exactly the same thing happened to me. I got molested. Okay. So got molested. And I was like, the place that we moved at was very um, Schubert Park, Google Schubert Park. That place was hectic. It was that's where your gangsters came out of, you know, and that's where me and my younger brother started dabbling in. We started hanging out with a lot of gangsters that was way older than what we were. Sorry to take you back. No worries. What age are you moving to Schubert Park? Um, 12, 13. 12, 13. Yeah, 12, so 13. So it's within that two-year yes. span. Yes. Okay, so you move there mm -hmm. because... You don't have the vocabulary, uh, vocabulary as a child to articulate to your father that I'm not protected in this place. In fact, I'm being violated repeatedly. Mm. Um, but I'll say to you, let's move for other reasons. Yes. And, yes. and dad, like a good protector that he was trying to be, he listens and you guys do move. Not only that, bro, you be careful of like making a little child be responsible for adults things. Huh. I had to take care of like, okay, we staying in this crap hole. Let's do something. Okay, my f I need to get my family. Like, you know, I had to grow up quickly. Sure. So I knew through my friends, which was predominantly white. Like, try and picture this. I lived in a place where it was just solidly white people, mm -hmm. right? So we moving from like an English place that is sunny side to like an Afrikaans place, which is central, CBD of Pretoria. So then uh, my dad was like, okay. He didn't, I didn't think he thought about it. He just thought, okay, it's a better place. Let me pull my exile moves and try and get into that place. Because we couldn't afford it, my dad, but my dad somehow got it right. Sure. And then I got sexually abused by the neighbor again. Okay. And then that's when I thought, okay, that's it. Street life, thug life for me. How did that happen? Do you remember? The? Molestation. By the molestation. Neighbor. Same way. They groom you the same way. And you would think that I would say, so you this thing now that I think about it. Imagine you're running away from your neighbor. You go to the, you, you're thinking you're going to a better place because you're trying to escape that pedophile. And then, so it, how many are these people really? Because why would it happen again with like a next door neighbor? And this guy wasn't even allowed to be in those flats, she would park. So I think because he was very successful, it doesn't make sense. So I think somehow that's what was because he 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 had like five star restaurants hmm. and everything. But he had this like place and he had like this bed and this camera. So hmm. obviously his domestic worker would go and get kids from the township and he would molest them there. Now that I'm older, I put one and one together. Yes. Trafficking kids from the township yeah. for a rich man yeah. who is influential yeah. by his domestic worker. For sure. Um, putting them in a flat in a low-cost area because it's, you got it. it's unsuspected. There we go. Putting on a camera because he's so sick in the head. He yeah. wants to record this. You got it, brother. You got it. That's what... That's that. But for me, he didn't have to go to the township. Ah, she's right here. Right I, here. Sorry, I just want to echo. His racism exists in every other area besides when he wants to molest young kids. That's what I'm saying. And it happened to me so much that racism that you're talking about, right? They don't like blacks, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So imagine. Okay, then anyway, so I was again playing outside and the cat came out. I love animals. So people that you'll see like, so I went to that cat and I was like playing with that cat. And he's like, again, nothing's like happy. Hello, this has been the same thing. I wish you could see how they groom you and why we get allured in. I'm like a tough cookie. Like I, I told you I'm an empath. We can see through people. It's weird how as a child you just let that happen. I guess it, there is an emptiness that you just allow that to happen, mm -hmm. right? So then anyway, so he sexually abused me. And then at 13, when I became a teenager, I was like, wait a minute, this is wrong. This is wrong. 
And then I kind of like pulled away. Oh, and he was buying groceries for, for my family, right? Mm -hmm. And then when I grew older, there was a time without me like, guys, I have to say this. You know, I see now we're living in a world where I know I was like a bad girl growing up, right? But even this ex-bad girl, I'm like, yo, what the heck is happening in this world now, right? I see like a lot of shows where girls are giving their souls sexually and the parents are okay with it because you're bringing that bride pack into the house. Mm. You're going to answer to that. Be careful what you put a blind eye for in selling your child's soul. Mm. You understand? So parents are okay with whatever jobs people are doing out there that's like killing the soul. As long as we had that, that, that's where we are now. It's like crazy out there right now. I, I'm even like, yo, this is on another level. Anyway, so then I dropped out of school, got into gangsterism. Gangsterism at 13, 14. 13, 14, myself that, that and my brother. That's six, as you say. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. How do you get into gangsterism? Well, these are guys from the, um, from the 70s. Like we used to hang around 40-year-olds, 30-year-old thugs that came from like New Lock Prison and somehow they would go to Schubert Park Flats and there was a level, P level, that the kids are supposed to play but they couldn't play there because we took over, right? Mm -hmm. Even though I got involved with them, I didn't do what they did, but that was like family, you know? But I was so, I guess, so advanced that I would leave that, 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 that project flats and go to like your mainland, your, um, to, to look for job opportunities. So I always worked. That was, was weird. I always, always worked. So I didn't get into like that gangsterism that they did. I just... I just worked and anyway, so then, so then I got, I started getting involved in drugs at the age of 11 and 12 and I was, I wore so many hats, like it, it was a fast train because when I'm at Schubert Park, then I'm with the gangs, right? But I seem to like talk about just the gangs, there's so much craziness, I'm talking about gangs that stood these guys were so crazy in the head that they'd walk around with X's in their pockets. They'd walk around with guns in their pockets. They were dark. All you see is like someone flying down, someone stabbing someone. Like that's, that's your lifestyle. It's like just violence all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And then I have to go to work and then work is in the upper class. So those are a lot of ravers. And that's the rave scene, that's the party scene. So I'm smoking mandrakes with these guys. And I'm always the only female there, right? I'm smoking mandrakes with them. I'm going to my work. I'm meeting all these upper class party girls. I'm going to the clubs with them and I'm getting high on ecstasy. Hmm. So usually there's a break for people. Like people will be just only addicted to mandrakes or just drugs and ecstasy. I was rotating in my lifestyle. So at home, I'm with the gangsters, smoking mandrags. Then I'm at work, going to the parties with the ravers. So it was clockwise of me doing drugs 24 hours. Were you a functional addict at that point? Yes. Mm. Yep. How does one become a functional addict? You, these drugs stop being effective? What's happening in your body and your brain at the time, if you reflect? Okay, so... Uh, you can't be a functional addict for too long. So for many, many years, I thought that I had it under control until I turned 23. Uh -huh. So my fellow black people, we have been through so much. We have, and I'm specifically saying my fellow black people, and we run to alcohol, we run to the clubs, we run, we run to so many things like I did, right? And for the longest time, if you looked at me, you wouldn't say she takes drugs, right? Um, sorry, my throat. <coughs> Just have some water. No problem. Mm -hmm. I thought this wouldn't happen. So, and I've got braces, so it's quite a mission. So you wouldn't, if you looked at me, you wouldn't say that she takes drugs, okay? But when I turned 21, that's when I started using... Um, um, what do you call it? Crack cocaine. Huh. So everybody that's going to see this, they're going to say, happy, no, happy. You were like this cool party chick. There's no ways that you were, you worked, you had your own place, you had your own car. Uh, what are you talking about this life that you lived? When did this happen? So when I turned 21, 
the stuff that happened to me as a kid only started being traumatic for me. So the one day I left my boyfriend's place, I left my work and I went straight to the streets and I became melancholy, like mad for three years. So I didn't have control of the drugs anymore. What happened to me as a kid and all those traumas that you were living every day, you think you're surviving, but it's building a character that is going to ma- end up making you all Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here I am. I sold my, I, I, I rented out my apartment. I gave my car to my younger brother who's doing well, who's a good kid. And then I just disappeared for three years into the streets. And then I was stuck in the streets of Hilbra. I was stuck in the streets of KZN. KZN, I was like, I was also into gangsterism there, you know. Um, yeah, the things that I saw with my eyes is scary. Like what's happening in the streets is is, is scary, you know. And um, so I was basically the walking dead. So... In KZN, I got arrested because when you hit the streets, it's either you get into prostitution or you get into thug life. I did not get into prostitution, but it doesn't make my sin different. I've said this before. I can be extremely masculine, right? So I was rolling with the guys and then we took care of business in a different way. So I saw a lot for me to be, like, I still have a lot of triggers. I'm still quite intense. As much as I say I have a lot of love to give and everything, I'm still quite an intense, aggressive person. But because of the love of God, you know, I am where I am now. But I, I you need to understand that it was so bad that I was literally the walking dead. Take us through the life in the streets. Okay, so me and my brother decided, okay, we're leaving Pretoria. Pretoria is crazy. We don't get it. And the white people were starting to move out. 99, 2001, the white people are, like, moving out. The black people are moving in. Even Sherwood Park is, like, becoming something else. Um, that's another sad part. Like, if you think about us black people, we're very clean people, right? Even if you go to a shack, you'll see the shack is properly polished and stuff like that. But the fact of the matter is, yes, we say, we say thank you, God, or we say thank you for apartheid ended and we got given all of these things. But notice, like, when the, these white guys, and people are going to come at me, I don't care, but if these white, when these white guys was running the joints, they were taking care of, like, business. I mean, Shibut Park, there's a lot of things that, that, that I'll give you a, an example with Shibut Park. When I was staying at Shibut Park, the place was taken care of, Right. It took two years for the place to be, like, demolished, right? And who's moved in? It's our people. So you kind of question it. If we are these clean people and why does everything that we sort of, like, it starts getting run down? Why does it get run down? It is greed. It is greed, greed, greed. It's not because we don't know how to maintain it. You're going to get a person that's going to say, okay, because you have color of your skin, I'm going to give you their affirmative action. There you go, run the place. And that person is going to be greedy and not handle the place like they're supposed to handle it. And sadly, that's where we live in now, that um, yes, we thank God for freedom, but at what cost? At what cost? Because we've lost our principles of like, good manners and 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 I'm not even judging I as and I'm gonna keep using the black race because I had such a huge identity crisis growing up thinking that oh you know I talk white I spoke white and now that I'm older I'm embracing like this ain't me people that know me like I I used to doll myself up I was that girl yeah right so I'm like I'm, I'm embracing I'm embracing what we are and um but sadly, people are so westernized, like that, like we're losing it. We're losing it. Um, what was your question? No, don't, don't stress. You and your brother decide to move out of Pretoria. Yeah, okay. The life me, in the, the dark life. The yeah. Street. So me and my brother's like, okay, we live in Pretoria again. That's why I probably went that way. Because Pretoria was going down. And we had to move out of Sherwood Park. There was just a lot of foreigners. People were dealing drugs and everything like that. We doing drugs and we're like, okay, uh, my father passed away. We can't afford the place anymore. So I'm like, let's get out of here. Let's go to Natal. My brother's the one that says, let's go to Durban, okay? 
we get there first thing already people want to do business with us yo let's go do this i'll show you how you do this you know people always have this like big propositions with me like how to handle business you know go to the car this we're going to do steal cars we're going to do that but because of the happy that i am like i'll give you a proposition so you will think that so i usually went for like drug dealers yes i do take drugs but drug dealer is like he like killing the generation. I'm mm-hmm. gonna I'm gonna kill you, mm-hmm. right? So what I would do is that I come up with this this idea to a drug dealer. Like, look, this is what I can do. This is how I can handle business. The drug dealer will believe that that's what I can do, and then give me this free drugs, and I'll have to go sell those drugs. And I don't sell those drugs. I take the drugs. So yeah, living that lifestyle, like I I saw a lot. Like, I saw a lot. I'm not, I'm not going to share in detail, but it, it is crazy out there. It's very crazy out there. And it's going at a very fast speed. What did you see that that which you can share? I'll give you an example, right? So this is what poverty is making our people do, right? Yeah. So I will get to, like, a dealer's house, right? So when you see a dealer, you see, like, this, this, like, hardcore thug. That's who they used to be. Now you'll see an auntie that looks like me that has five girls in her house. And on Sunday, she goes to church. That's what you and see. And wears a uniform. That, and wears a uniform, but she's got five girls that she's pimping. Dealers now are the normal mama the, who wears no. blue, red, no. white, black and white uniform, goes to church. Yes. Uh, yes. Is known on her WhatsApp status for yes. her Bible verses. Yes. But she's dealing drugs from her home. Yes. And then again, please, can the gays, can the lesbians not come at me? Because, again, that's what I saw. So I used to, I don't even want to say that I used to be gay. I'm sorry that I'm touching on this, but I think I have to. It's fine. People need to understand, if you are gay, okay, I feel like people shouldn't, it's, it must be a personal thing that you're going through as a person, and now in the society, what's happening, it's, it's becoming so diluted, right? I have to bring this up. It's becoming so diluted and misused because I thought when I became born again, I was like, oh, I don't have that, that spirit of le- even the word lesbian. I mean, like, who, can, who invents these names? There are real people that's going, going, going about the struggle of being gay or being a, a lesbian. I was part of that. So when I became born again, I thought, oh, I'm not attracted to women anymore, right? So what I saw, you asked me, tell me what you saw in there. I saw so many straight people coming into these houses with the gay prostitutes and then going back to their homes with with their marriage and kids and pretending like everything goes on. So you understand that it's a dogged dog world and and this is going to be so deep like I had a lot of um please don't understand what I'm saying I've had a lot of um like gay I mean straight girls come at me right it's easy for me to say you know I've got I've got swag I'll get you and then immediately we're confusing that straight girl because we think that we can get you but then they're also using us because they think they have. It's such a deep thing. What I'm yeah. saying is that be careful of falling into something that you're not if you're not. Mm. Don't play with it. Because there are people, and also religion likes to say, we are going to take you. you. You're going straight to hell. Oh, no, once you're gay, yeah. you're going straight to hell. Once you're lesbian, you're going straight to hell. Okay, here, Jesus loves me. Why was I attracted to women? I'm still attracted to women, but yeah. I don't open that door. I'm married now, I've got kids, I don't open that door. It's my choice. But I still have that attraction. I just choose not to, okay? But there are people now that's playing a dangerous game because now, let's say the innocent guy that's really gay and is really battling, really trying to discover themselves, this one with his selfishness that is, that, that is not gay is is going to fall for you. You're going to fall for him deep. And next thing he's going to his family and you're sitting here with a broken heart. And then, so that's what I saw as well in the streets where 
people who go home and be what they are not, but behind in that underworld, they do a lot of crazy things. Powerful people. Crazy things, yes. Important people. Important people. people. With, with names that are revered in society. Yes, that's what I saw. So it's really a doggy dog world there. It's, it's, it's just crazy. Yeah. You were arrested. Mm. In Kaiser and Durban, what were you mm. arrested for? I was arrested many times. I was arrested in Sunnyside. I was arrested in Kaiser Um I was. I'm not going to get into detail with what I did because it's going to give people ideas. I know some people tend to really go with like, okay, this is what I did. But remember, I said I don't do prostitution, and I, I, I kind of like got what I wanted, but um, it took a lot of a gift of the gab. It took a lot of like conning to do. So the things that, that men got arrested for and were sentenced for long by using weapons and stuff like that, I did it without using weapons. But I'm not going to sit here and say what I did because I'm not proud of what I did. Yeah. But that was the reason for my arrest, yeah. If, if there's nothing else with the, 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 the street life and the thug life, I'd, 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 I think it's important that we discuss your restoration and yes. how it began. Yeah. When did the restoration begin? Is there a particular person you can point out, for example, and say, it was in 2008 I bumped into Sipo at ShopRite and he took me to church. Just take me through how that... You are was. very prophetic. You're a deep boy. <laughs> boy, you deep. Thank you. Like for real, yeah. you have a gift. So, um, so what happened? Yes, it was at my restoration was through my daughter. Okay. So I always had like serious boyfriends. Like I dated for long. You know, the only people that I'd like sort of like cheat on is like them girls, right? But I dated for a very long time, and I uh, remember I told you I left my boyfriend's house, who I'm now married to. Okay. okay. But I never thought that I have, I'd have a child out of wedlock. Okay. So when I was in them streets, I met a, a drug dealer. And I didn't even know he's a drug dealer. And I didn't even know he was younger than me either. Because he's tall and stuff like that, right? So I was getting high. And I was about, so I came out of this drug dealer's house and I saw this guy that came out, but he wasn't articulating like in a Nigerian accent or Tanzanian accent. He was articulating like, he had like a South, Af South African accent. He's like, hey, do you remember me? And I was like, this Nika better know that I don't talk to any male figures. They better warn him. Maybe he's new in the blog. Mm -hmm. They better warn him that this girl doesn't talk to guys like that. She ain't like that. Mm -hmm. And then he carries on. Do you remember me? So I'm like, okay, maybe he could be from school. So yeah. let me give this brother a chance. So I turn around and he's like, we caught a cab together two weeks ago. And I remembered, oh, yes, I did catch a cab with him when I was like, I, I, I slung a move. Slung a move is like when you took care of business, like the stuff that I don't want to get into. And then I was trying to run back to Sunnyside to get my drugs. And this guy was in the cab with me. And two weeks later, that's who I met out of the drug dealer's house. And then we try to have something going on there. And then a child came out of this, right? My first daughter. So then that's when the restoration happened for me. Now, don't try and picture happy the party girl that had her own car, her own house. I was like my lullaby out. Mm. I was like my lullaby. I was like a thug, the streets. I was like, mm. I didn't look the part, but I was the walking dead, mm. right? And then here I am. My mom's like, okay, so I finally went back home after three years. And um, my mom's like, let me take you back to the roots. Let me take you back to Zim. And then that's when I found God, came back. I was going to get a, a job as a um, air hostess, but then I was overweight and I wasn't feeling well. Then they, my mom took me and my sister f took me to the hospital, found out that I was six months pregnant because I was tiny. I always weighed like 45. I was like a tiny girl, right? And I was like, but I haven't been with no nobody, no male guy. And I remembered, oh, it's that brother that I sort of had a thing with. And, um, and, I promise you, that's why I believe in God the way. I had no money. I had no work. Now, you explain this to me. How does someone that comes from the streets, when I went to give birth to my, to my daughter, I gave birth at a government hospital. 
that the room that I gave birth in, they had renovated it, right? And then when I went home, there was boxes and boxes of pampers, like boxes of pampers and clothes and stuff like that. And I was just so surprised that like, okay, this can only be God, okay? Then move, then we moved to Santa Johannesburg. And then as my sister's like, okay, let me try and get a job for you. Then I got a job as a receptionist. I stopped drugs. I stopped alcohol immediately the minute that I found out that I was pregnant with my daughter. Okay. This job that I had was an office job. There's mm -hmm. no ways that I was going to have the job. It's just by God that because I don't have qualification. Oh, so I worked for the big corporate company for many, many years. There's a lot of things where I'm sitting here in shock and I'm like, it can only be God. Yeah. There was times, I mean, I traveled abroad, me and my daughter. By the way, the brother, when I said I was pregnant, he's like, uh, you know. Whatever. Yeah, n not in that way. I was, I was a gangster chick. So he doesn't know that I'm born again. So he's still scared of like that girl that I was, you know. So people, I know women were like to say, oh, but he left. He left. But you need to know the part that you played as well. So. So. So then, um, yeah, this child just made me stop everything. And then I got married to my, uh, my boyfriend that I grew up with. And um, the rest is just history. But even till today, I'm clean and I'm out of that lifestyle for 18 years now. And I cannot believe the stuff. Like, you, like, I don't even have to have, like, because of COVID, I lost my job, that corporate job that I was telling you about. And this husband that I married about, it doesn't mean that, okay, you've been taken care of because of your husband. No, I've seen favor locate me in like a serious way. Come on. That's got nothing to do with my husband. Yes. Me and my child, how I got her, right? We're sitting on a flight traveling to America on holiday. We go there every year. Like, how does that even happen? The lifestyle that I live, it's like blowing my mind. And I'm talking about material stuff, but... But I'm good. And it's always like being faithful to God. There was a time that I wanted to go to America. Even when you're born again, there's still stuff that you go through. Sure. I was like, America, here we come. My sister lives there. I was like, we're going to party. But I stayed in the house like a party pooper. There's stuff that you have to do that you don't want to open windows to. Huh. It's a struggle. You're like, okay, I'll set you aboard and stuff like that. God will reveal how you can enjoy this heaven on earth. Yeah, yeah. You yeah, know, God yeah. will reveal that. Just, just, I was like, no, happy in America. Just go, go party, go. And I was like, no, I sat in the board because I know myself. That's the thing. If you know what your weakness is, don't play with that. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. just don't play with that. So, yes, the aftermath of it is beautiful, but there are still struggles. And especially as females, I'm just saying, just know where the danger's at. Yeah, yeah I know yeah. when you go out there, it seems nice, you know. You know, like I'll give you an example. Like if you go to to the gym, because I like going to the gym, I like working out. I'm a tomboy, so I I can like really work out with a guy, and that's cool. But but I'm married now, right? So so and and as well, it's so important, brothers. I'm gonna say this: you have to love. A woman like your sister, it has to be like a sister, vice versa. Like, like you have to, I, I heal a lot of mask, a lot of men because I'm quite masculine, but I can't do that because somehow as, if you come to someone with like a sisterly motive, right. And a brotherly motive, there's no door for, for catching feelings, Correct. right. We need to overcome that. We really, really need to overcome that. The one time I was looking at people, like this is where the human mind is gone now. Somebody was taking a film of this girl. You know, you'll see there's a lot of likes on, 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 on a production when people are talking about, oh, like girls are like down talking themselves. People like that because they're being entertained. Mm -hmm. but, but people won't think like, no, man. But anyway, so this person was taking a form of this this girl, like, all, like, naked in public and stuff like that. Like, how do you film that? That's where our mind has gone. Black brothers, you need to take care of your sisters. I know we come across as, like, being loose or whatever. Don't entertain that. Don't, like, just 
I think that's what they need. They need that really pure, innocent, brotherly love because maybe they don't have a father figure. Fathers, stop trying to like mack these young girls. Like we need to be examples, guys. We need to change our ways because if we're going to copy the Western life, we're going down quick. We're going down quick. We need those manners back. We need, we just need to be good people. Right now we are being greedy, 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 and we're selling our souls and it's going to be ugly. We need to get God back into our hearts. I know we're dabbling with a lot of spiritual stuff right now. It's getting really ugly, like alcohol consumption. People are just, it's just crazy. And people are not seeing it. They're thinking it's fun, you know. Like, don't be fooled by what's happening in the Western world. There's a lot of Americans coming here just because the guy's talking with swag and stuff like that. That guy's going to pimp you girls and you think it's okay. It's not. We come from a beautiful culture. We need to wake up. Like, I've lived that life. I'm not saying from judging. I'm just saying... Try and be who you are. You're Zulu for a reason. You're Twana for a reason. There's a reason. We've, we've got a beautiful culture. You can't want to throw all of that away just to be wasting. Like you can balance it out. It's not the deep being like a child of God. It really isn't, you know. So that's where I'm at with this. <laughs> when nearing the end of our conversation, your, your journey with God comes across to me. You said something about favor locates me so many times. In so many areas of my life. And I don't deserve it. And it just reminds me that the grace of God doesn't care who you are. It's just there. Mm -hmm. The faithfulness of God doesn't care who you are. It's just there. The faithfulness of God is because God is true to himself in his faithfulness. Because God respects principles. And if God says, I'll be faithful in your life regardless of whether you are in me or you're choosing to live a life outside of me. But he says, I will never leave you. So it, 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 it's just that the parallel that you live the life, a thug life, what you call a thug life, where you harmed and hurt other people. Mm. But God said, you're still enough to come back. Bro, you're still worthy of coming bro, back. I'm so shocked. You're still worthy, not just to come back, but for multiplication, for greatness, for more, mm. the abundance that you live in now, mm. as you said. Um, so we, we, you, you speak of privilege and grace that many people perhaps thought is not possible for them. Back then, did you ever think you could be where you are no, today? No, no, no. I was, I was like, I don't even have, no. It's like, it's 18 years ago, bro. I still pinch my life with like, what the heck? Did God really love me? Like, that's the thing. My, my way of thinking was like, so, it's like I was in the gutter. I didn't think like, oh, I want to, you know, like I want to live in Santa and I want to drive this car. I still drive an old car that's like from 2010. I can't afford to drive a nice car. I'm just, I'm so glad that God has made, I come from that kind of poverty mindset. Because that's the thing as well. It's like if the black man is from poverty and now we get this money, we go crazy on it. Then we blew it. But I'm so glad that I was able to like just be humble. Like even till today, I'm still humble. So for me, it's, it's a shock every day. I don't like, okay, this happened to me. Let me just, um, okay, it's part of it. I still like, wow, God, you did that for me. It's like God's just remaining faithful. And trust me, I got like demons. I'm like, I'm like a difficult chick to be with. But, but God's looking at the heart. My heart's so pure. And it's, it's beautiful. It's just the triggers and because of how the world made you that I am the way that I am. So people shouldn't be hard on themselves. You'd be surprised. Like, you'll be surprised how God loves you. Like, it will blow your mind. But just do your part as well and trust God, you know. Last but not least, what's the one thing you know for sure? What's the one thing I know for sure? Yeah. Urabian. In life, what's the one thing you okay. believe in? You absolutely okay. believe in and you're certain of. And, and you like in, in this thing in life, That's beautiful. I know for sure. God is real. Yeah. Because I've seen it in my life. I'm the type of girl, get my kolaka one. Like, if you tell me you love me, bro, you're telling me you love me. That's all. Anyone can tell you love me. I need to see in your actions. Like my husband doesn't tell me he loves me, but I see it in his actions, right? So how am I going to believe this Jesus that, that, that doesn't exist? Because I saw it in his actions. Come on. So you have, guys, you can't say Jesus and all of that. Jesus is real. If you're going to be st still thinking about Jesus' color, you can't be doing that right now. This thing comes from us, guys. Jesus' story is real. So one thing that I'm going to stay, stay remaining is, is through Jesus Christ are we, uh, are we saved. 
and that God is real. My takeaway from this episode is that you can live what Happy described as a thug life, which for you might not be a thug life. You might not be in drugs, but you might be at rock bottom. You might think it's over. You might think I can just give up. You might even be thinking of taking your own life, mm. but you don't have to. There is exceedingly abundantly above more than you can ask, think or imagine that is possible for you too. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you learned and I hope you continue to grow with us with more growth conversations. I will see you on the next episode. Introducing the epitome of luxury living, Galu Luxury Villas and Suites, your private sanctuary of opulence and elegance. Nestled amongst the lush, sun-kissed landscapes of Durban, KwaZulu-Natal, this Galu Luxury Villa is a paradise of tranquility, offering breathtaking panoramic views of the neighborhood. Step into a world of refined luxury where every detail has been meticulously crafted to create an atmosphere of sophistication and comfort. This villa is kept within a gated and secure property for your peace of mind. The Kalu Villa is available for both short-term and long-term stays, making it the ideal location for your next vacation or special event. This villa boasts spacious living areas and floor to ceiling windows that flood the interior with natural light, making you feel at one with the surrounding beauty paired with multiple terraces, an outdoor lounge and a dining area. Live the dream, make memories and indulge in the life you deserve. Contact us today to book your stay or to learn more about this exquisite property. Your oasis of opulence awaits.